Welcome back to part two of the zombies. Now where we left off, the zombies had just finished off two of the worst years of chart success any 60s band had. Very few bands would have the pride and the endurance to go on and create their finest work. So they intended to continue on. And the first change that they made was to get rid of their producer, Ken Jones. Jones was a fine producer. They liked him, they got along well with him, but they felt that the way he mixed it, it took the edge off a lot of their songs. And they wanted to be more progressive. And the band really understood their strengths at this point. And Ken Jones was more of a guy who played it safe as a producer. And the Zombies no longer wanted to play it safe. And these were not the times to play it safe. So that was a really good call on their part. At the dawn of the psychedelic age, the Zombies were positioned pretty well to compete with just about anybody. And they had already experimented with a little bit of a psychedelic sound on the B-side of the previous single called She Does Everything For Me. Now you can say goodbye and I don't care. One of the unique things about the Zombies was that they hired out the producer independently and they didn't really have, they weren't signed to a record label. They would lease their songs out to record labels. So there was really no label to drop them. So that's why they were able to persevere, I think, this long. And for this next project, they found themselves choosing EMI to do their next recording at Abbey Road. The Zombies were the first band to work at EMI who wasn't signed to the labels. And the Beatles had just finished recording Sgt. Pepper. So the Zombies only had $1,000 of studio time which to record this next record. And so they had to make best use of their time. So what they did is they came extremely well rehearsed to these sessions and they recorded in really three spurts. And uh, they had the vocal arrangements all down, the arrangements were all down. Basically, they came to these sessions the opposite of the way the Beatles came to the Get Back sessions. They came completely prepared. Despite the poor chart success the previous two years, bands still did cover their songs, like that last song, I Want Her, She Wants Me, which was done by the Mindbenders. Now, one of the advantages to the Zombies choosing EMI and working at Abbey Road was that they are following the Beatles, and they, they had made some advancements in recording during that album, and one of the things that was left behind was John Lennon's Mellotron. So the band would have loved to have done, used a lot of strings on this in these recordings, but they just didn't have the money. So Arjun started working on Lennon's Mellotron to augment the recordings in lieu of strings. So you can hear the orchestrated depth that that Mellotron provides these, these previous three songs I just played. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about the players here. Um, one of the guys in the band who doesn't get a lot of play, well we always hear about Rod Argent with his keyboard playing and the breathy vocals of Colin Blundstone. Chris White was an excellent composer. Uh, his bass playing is solid. Paul Atkinson, the guitar player, though their, their songs aren't super guitar based, when he has to play, he's great. But the guy I want to talk about a little bit is Hugh Grundy, because I think he is their secret weapon. I think he's got a similar drag on the drums that Ringo Starr has, and Grundy's playing gives the Zombies recordings throughout their whole career wonderful character. Do you remember golden days and golden summer sun? Although they were very efficient, these recordings spent several months in between which they were gigging. They also released two singles. The first one was uh, Friends of Mine in September. In November, they released Care of Cell 44. It feels so good to know two people so in love, so in love. Now, neither of these songs charted. Now, we're getting end of 1967, early 68 here, and one of the things that kind of 
pissed off the band was that uh, another group called People uh, from San Jose in the States covered one of their songs called I Love You, and they had a big hit with it. So they were, <laughs> they were like, why can't we have hit with our own song? So that was another disappointment for them. So another thing that frustrated them is when they turned in the finished album to CBS, they turned in a mono version, but <laughs> CBS required a stereo mix. So that Chris White and Rod Argent had to spend their own money to make that stereo mix. Now the album was released in April of 1968 in the UK, but it was not even given a release in the United States. You know, having given their best and still failing miserably by not getting a, even a US release, the band felt completely demoralized. A few of the members of the band, they generally made their money gigging and without hits to promote, how are they going to continue to make money? Rod Argent and Chris White made considerable more money because of the publishing, but the band was at a bit of a crossroads here if to even continue. Now, help arrived in American Al Cooper, who was doing some A&R work for CBS, and he came back with a load of our albums, and he, he bought this album, and he absolutely loved it. So he went to CBS head Clive Davis and said, whatever you do, acquire this album. This, we should release this album. And Davis said, you know what, we already own that album and we just passed on it. <laughs> so what they did is they did release the album finally in the States. So Odyssey and Oracle did get a proper release and a single that went out to promote it was the song Butcher's Tale, Western Front 1914. Kind of an odd choice of a single, but this was an anti-war song and the label was just figuring, gonna capitalize on this anti-war movement, which was very popular in the charts at the time. Predictably, Butcher's Tale did not chart, so Al Cooper got back involved and said, hey, release Time of the Season as a single. So that was released as a single in October of 68, and it did not chart, it didn't go anywhere. But by early 69, they re-released it because they still believed in it and put a different B-side on the back, and it slowly began to climb the charts. Of the season for love. Time of the Season broke of all places in the state of Idaho and it went to number one in Cashbox and number two in Billboard. So it became a big nationwide hit and although it was released twice as a single in the UK, it didn't chart, so go figure. Now by this time the band was breaking apart. Paul Atkinson went into computers and then became an A&R guy with Dick James Music, eventually discovering and signing Elton John, ABBA, Bruce Hornsby and Mr. Mister. Colin Blunstone at this point uh, left the band. To, he briefly went into insurance. Now the time of the season was a huge hit. CBS wanted some new product. So Chris White, Rod Argent, and Hugh Grundy continued to record with White and Argent on lead vocals. Weave the spell of into patterns of my life. I heard a sad song and the song made in order to complete what would be the next album, they brought Colin Blundstone back and he worked on a couple tracks on lead vocals. No matter what you do, she'll be for you. I know she will. I know she will. I'll share with you. Baby, walking in the sun. So in about spring of 69, a single was released from these sessions called Imagine the Swan, and it got to number 109 in Billboard, 77 in Cashbox, and a very respectable number 59 in Canada. I'll imagine the swan that you were Colin Blundstone didn't participate on all these tracks, but Chris White and Arad Arjun just continued to record, and these are some of the tracks they were working on for potential inclusion of this next album. I can see her, then the sun will smile, a summer sunshine smile to Julia. She 
Meanwhile, Colin Blundstone returned to the studio and started recording under the name Neil MacArthur, and he did a re-recording of the song She's Not There. Here's the Italian version of that. To show you what a Colin Blundstone solo album may have sounded like at this time, here are three cover versions that are excellent, but they remained unreleased at the time. It's just no good anymore when you walk through the door of an empty room and you go inside and set a table for one. It's no fun when you have to spend the day without her. Someday I will be free and there'll be times just wait. Since the Zombies refused to reunite for a tour, a bogus Zombies band popped up in the States, and they were out of Texas, and what's interesting is it included two guys from the future band ZZ Top, Dusty Hill and Frank Beard. So they performed as the Zombies uh, the, until there was an injunction forcing them to stop. Now, they had enough tracks to do another album. Now, this album came out more recently. But this album originally made it to Acetate stage in 1969, but was never released. And part of the reason was, is the next single that they did, If It Don't Work Out, did not chart. All right, so let me back up here a little bit. We just showed you the R.I.P. album, Zombies, Rest in Peace. I'm just going to back up here because what we had here, Odyssey and Oracle having gone through so many different releases and non-releases. So this is the, what the British cover looked like with the spelling, uh, just the name of the album here and this artwork here. And Odyssey is spelled wrong, by the way. <laughs> and the American version had the name reprinted up here that was just easier to read. So when the song Time of Season became an official hit in earlier 69, there was a re-release of the album, which took this artwork right in here, cropped it severely, and released it like this. So the back of the album, uh, the British one was colored, and the American one was black and white. So those are just some of the uh, variations on the album that was released. With the Zombies done, Rod Argent and Chris White formed a new band called Argent, and they added Jim Rodford on bass, that's Rod Argent's cousin, uh, and Russ Ballard on lead vocals. Now, Chris White at this point was just going to be a writer, composer, and do some producing. He wasn't really an active playing member of the band. And what was fortuitous for those guys is they were able to sign a deal with CBS Records not long after they had a number one record with time of the season, so that was a pretty easy negotiation for them, and Argent's first album came out in 1970. Also by 1970, Colin Blundstone had shed the Neil MacArthur name, going back to his name and having Chris White and Rod Argent produce his first album, and that produced the hit single, Say You Don't Mind, and another excellent song called Carolyn Goodbye. Now I'm doing some finding, so say you don't mind, you don't mind, you let me off this time. That last song that was written for Colin Blundstone's girlfriend at the time, Carolyn Monroe, who was an actress. Did I leave some of those Carolyn Monroe pictures up a little too long? I, I apologize. And now Argent, uh, they had some hits of their own. One of their early hits was a song that was covered by Three Dog Night called Liar. And they had these two, which you might also recognize.
so Argent went on to have a pretty decent career, releasing albums for about 1976-77. And Rod Argent played on some other people's records. Namely, he played on the Who's Who Are You? And he sang some backing vocals on there, too. Now, the, the Zombies and Argent, they went away for many years. And the Zombies finally reformed in the early 2000s. And they started to tour again. And one of the albums I like to mention, they did an album in 2015 called Still Got the Hunger. And I started to watch the Zombies play live at this time. Great band if you get the chance to see them play. And this particular album was excellent and just very well done. And one of the songs on there used a little lyric from the song Yesterday by the Beatles. And, and it was an affectionate nod to the song and it's kind of a nostalgic song. And they were about to embark on a tour and uh, this was the tour I was going to see. And they said this at the, at, at the concert. They said this tour almost didn't happen and the album almost didn't get released because of that lyric. Sony had said that, hey, you can't use that lyric. So with the tour on the line and possibly withholding the entire album, they frantically called Paul McCartney and through his, his uh, people, they got a hold of him, he listened to the song, loved it, and said, hey, use it, no problem at all, I love it. And there is not another place that I would rather be than here. No case for chasing the past. Just like the Beatles used to say, I believe in yesterday. The album Still Got That Hunger actually charted and the band enjoyed some success and some acclaim on that album. And as I said, they do tour once in a while if you're able to see them. The joke around is that the Zombies have the best lead singer from any band into the 60s that isn't Mick Jagger. So if you get a chance to, to see those guys play, they're excellent. And, and sometimes they do the whole Odyssey and Oracle album with the remaining original members. So over the years, the Zombies' work has gained credibility in all kinds of circles. They're considered to be one of the better bands to come out of the 60s. Odyssey and Oracle is looked at as a masterpiece. And the, their entire catalog is, is really highly acclaimed. Now, John Lennon even said to Chris White at some point, boy, I would have loved to produce you guys. So they always got acclaim from their contemporaries as well. Now, let's look at some of the albums you can purchase uh, that are comps. I had mentioned R.I.P. This is now available uh, to buy as a single album. Um, let me just go to this one here. This is the first album I bought by the Zombies. And I, this came out in 1974. It's called Time of the Zombies. I bought this when I was in college. It's a double album. And the great thing about it is that it's got, on one side, it's got all their singles from 64, 65. The se side two, it's got a lot of the unreleased stuff that didn't get released here. And sides three and four is the entire Odyssey and Oracle album. So if you're looking for some vinyl and looking to start at one place where you get just darn near everything, Time of the Zombies is a good place to start. Another album I picked up, um, this goes by a couple different titles. This is just called The Zombies, but there are several different versions of this that's called A's and B's. So it's all the A sides of their singles and all the B sides from 64 through early 67. And there are a whopping 22 tracks on this record. Another album I picked up in the 80s, I was buying um, albums by this company called Backtrack Records and Tapes, and uh, it was kind of, it was a budget label, and there are there's only eight songs on this album, but some of the songs that are on here were songs that were recorded for the R.I.P. sessions, so those showed up here in the '80s for the first time. So, and I didn't really know it at the time, but these were the three albums I had by them, and had a quite a, almost their whole catalog. Now, that's not all. They also came out with songs that they had recorded on the BBC. There was an album released on vinyl, and that's since been released on CD. And then there's the mammoth box set called Zombie Heaven, which has got 120 of their tracks. It's got unreleased recordings, and it's got uh, backing tracks and some alternate takes. Now, some of the other recordings that you can pick up, I had mentioned this album, the 66 album called The Zombies. It's also available on CD. Uh, the other one I would suggest getting is this one. It's called Into the Afterlife. 
and it has a, quite a lot of the uh, demos that were recorded for the R.I.P. album. So the Zombies are one of the reasons uh, I got so heavily into 60s music. There, was a lot, there are a lot of bands like this that have great melodies, great instrumentation, great song craftsmanship, great arrangements and an interesting story to go along with it. So I'm sure if you listen to the Zombies, you'll find uh, the same thing, and a lot of the other bands as well, which I will be covering on this channel. So check back for more great 60s bands here on Pop Goes the 60s.